Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Or I should say for Barclay and Cruz, bonsoir et buenas tardes. Um, I'm not a malandros. I often wish I was, but this is as close as I'm going to get. Um, and I'm sorry to arrive late. She had a last minute emergency and really regretted that she couldn't be here this evening, both to introduce uh, Sandra and Jean-Pierre to you all, but also to catch up on their work and to hear what they're doing, although they're here uh, in this country uh, at the moment teaching, unfortunately, at another university which has an inconvenient commute. They are going to discover, as I just did, that the, uh, although Lima and New York appear to be very different, it's not true. They're two cities with absolutely no reliable public transportation, which is why I'm breathless coming in. Um, so welcome to the world of infrastructure. It's one of the many things that you're thinking about. Um, I knew of Barclay and Cruz before I, got, you're always supposed to introduce us though, you're the only person in the world, but I knew of them already before um, I began a, a long period of research on the history of Latin American modern architecture and inevitably also engaging with the very lively scene in many places in court, in, including um, Lima. Um, I knew of them because of my own French connection and indeed they are a fascinating uh, architectural practice uh, because they have a, uh, it is a transatlantic practice and we're so used to transatlantic practices along the axis of North America, Europe, that a, uh, a practice that moves between the Atlantic coast of Europe and the Pacific coast of, uh, of Latin America is a fascinating one. And also one that moves between uh, the world of what we might call a, um, a declining technological utopia that is France and a world of much, that requires a much different response uh, to uh, not only climate but obviously issues of poverty, public infrastructure, uh, and I think that we're going to all get a great number of uh, lessons tonight of what I've been myself learning over the last decade of visiting uh, Latin America, but also visiting uh, their work, that there is a great deal uh, to be learned by people who are involved in dealing uh, with means that are sometimes more austere than the luxurious worlds of the North, but also that are at the forefront uh, of a recognition of uh, global changes, in particular climate change. I have managed to get in my crib notes the um, brief of their studio that they're doing at the unnamed university called Yale up north, uh, called Learning from Pura, uh, Building Resilience in Error of Climate Change. And they are, you're going to see, uh, dealing with the coast uh, in Peru in a very, very direct way. Uh, I'm sure you'll be introduced to the first project of theirs that I saw in reality, which is the place of memory, which is built into the very geology of Peru, but into a fragile geology, at the same time as it embraces the very complex issues of how a society comes to terms with a long period of uh, trauma. So it, and, uh, it, of course, is a place uh, that deals with the need to repair and to recover from the two decades of the Silver Path, uh, and of nearly daily terrorism uh, in uh, Peruvian life. Uh, it's not unique to Peru, a very uh, common situation. There are m projects like this in Mexico in, uh, and in particular in uh, Santiago de Chile. But a fascinating project, but I think might be a bit of the springing off point for the studio because the site that they build into uh, is uh, one that uh, appears as though it might fall into the sea at any given moment. Let me give a little bit of background uh, on Sandra Barclay and uh, Jean-Pierre Cruz. Uh, they are Peruvian born uh, and Peruvian educated, but they both uh, migrated during the very period uh, when Peru was so deeply troubled uh, to Paris. Uh, uh, continuing education there, but also teaching there. And in the case of Jean-Pierre, I believe, working for, uh, for Siriani, for Enrique Siriani or Henri Siriani. Uh, Siriani is a very interesting figure because uh, at the moment, uh, when France was beginning to uh, dabble uh, with the rise of postmodernism, Siriani took a position against that. And Siriani took a very strong position, held by others in France, that modernity was an incomplete project to riff on Habermas, which was a big uh, motif still of that, uh, of that um, period. So this is the realm that they uh, worked in first uh, in, um, in France. 
Uh, they have built a number of very significant projects in France, and they continue a, a, a bi-continental uh, practice, uh, but they are a prime locus of operation now um, is, is Lima. I think there's something you're going to discover in, in the work, although I don't know the full panorama that they're going to present to us um, uh, tonight. Oh, the basics are up here, actually. All the prizes, uh, very recently, the Crown Hall America's Prize. Uh, and a Sandra named Woman of the Year by the Architects Journal. But I think also to note some ways in which their work, both in listening tonight, but I think also in looking at their website and looking at the publications, relates to the work that you're doing in various studios. Uh, for one, they have been deeply involved in thinking about museological space. Uh, so if there are students here from the CCCP program, uh, in um, a, a building I saw before I knew, uh, I knew them, which is their incredible renovation in the 90s of one of the great unsung uh, works of French classic uh, post-war modernism. And this is the museum that now bears the name of André Malraux, the Malraux Museum of Le Havre, uh, which they renovated in the, uh, in the late 90s. I think it opened around 1999. An absolutely uh, exquisite renovation of a major building that both shows off their own talent uh, for thinking about how to intervene in an intelligent way to make another building sing. But more recently, uh, the opening uh, just a handful of years ago, I think finally in 2015, of the Place of Remembrance, uh, which is a museum but also a place to uh, remember. When Amal phoned me and said, could you please come and introduce them, I said, but Ken should introduce them because Ken was on the jury, I think, that selected uh, your project. Which You're going to show it, yes? which we will show tonight. Um, but involvement with other uh, museums that are um, nearing uh, completion. The Paracas Museum in the Southern Peruvian Desert. It's the project that was cited in the Architectural Record Architect of the Year uh, Award. Uh, and there has been a huge flurry of activity, private houses of, uh, of incredible um, subtlety, but also intervention in the public realm and very frequently um, museums. I should say also that they think very cogently about how one exhibits architecture. They have been involved with the Venice Biennale, both on display, uh, but in um, uh, two years ago, curating the Peruvian pavilion there. So I could go on and on. The list of awards is um, enormous. We're not the uh, first to recognize them, and I'm sure we're not the last, but we're absolutely delighted that you are here. I'm going to listen very attentively uh, and join you and moderate the discussion afterwards, if you like. So please, I don't know how you're going to present this, but join me in welcoming Sandra Barkley and Jean-Pierre Cruz. Um, uh, we are very pleased to be here. Thank you, Amal, for the invitation. Um, and of course, Barry, for your words and for hosting us. And also, Laila, for the tour she <laughs> made us in, in the campus. Yeah. When uh, of the few certainties we have about architecture is that um, in order to understand it, uh, we should see the reality of architecture. Uh, we have to be there. Um, of course, architecture is about a multi-sensorial and embodied uh, ex experience. So, there's always a problem about doing a lecture about our projects showing only pictures. So we are trying to um, show you uh, some um, side work, pictures, drawings, and, and little films in order to try to um, make you understand the, the, the meaning and, and, the, and the intentions uh, behind the, the projects, we are uh, showing you seven projects, all in, located in Peru, um, where, um, because we, we consider um, our work as an ongoing research uh, in which each project informs uh, the next one in terms of strategies, hypotheses, um, built-in processes, and results. And in every project we do, our first effort is to ask, uh, to find the good questions that will guide our decisions, and not, pretend, not pretending to find answers, but uh, with the aim to make us think about the means we have to 
we have at, uh, at our disposal and the meaning and the sense uh, the buildings should convey. Our long stay in Europe as young architect and a patient search through drawing gave us the insight on how to create a personal visual culture understanding what we considered important in architecture. It gave us, too, the needed distance to understand what could define architecture in our country. A constant and resolute work is, of course, part of this research. In each project, we go from sketches to the model, then to precise drawing, and then to the, into reality, and then back into sketches, models, and drawings. It's a circular dynamic between mind, hand, and matter. Our Peruvian culture comes with a wonderful past. We are interested in studying this fantastic legacy from the design strategies set in place to construct the landscape, not simply seeing them as archaeological remains. We are increasingly asking ourselves if nature, territory, landscape, architecture, and matter can still be seen as interdependent and with the same value. We consider if it's still possible to create an alternate approach to architecture, abandoning the, mo the modernist rigid separation of architecture, urban planning, design, and landscape architecture that make them a distinct and often polarized professions. We admire the ancient Peruvians for their knowledge to use what is available in order to give sensitive response to solve human needs, creating a wonderful landscape and understanding the territory within its own logics in order to build infrastructure and architecture. That's not quite the same thing happening today, as you can see. Um, in countries like ours, with almost no industry and an incipient economy, we have to imagine which are the resources or materials with which we can build. In conditions of permanent crisis and instability, we choose to work with what is available as often people do in, in our country. But working with what is available does not condemn us necessarily to uh, scarcity of means. For us, it's mainly a matter of turning the gaze to the possibilities our society, our climate, and our landscape give us. Due to these conditions, included uh, the mild climate, and, and the pre-industrial craftsmanship that, that we have. Um, we have some these this wonderful ingredients to work with. That is culture, territory, climate, place, program, and technology. And the strategy allows us to carefully measure uh, these ingredients to interact with the essential um, elements of architecture. So space, light, matter, and time. So le let's uh, take a look to our territory now. Peru is located in the heart of the tropics, quite at the same latitude as the sand sandy and coconut beach trees, trees beach <laughs> of South Asia or Brazil, for example. But huge differences start when we put color to this image. With color, we realize that the Peruvian coast harbors the coldest tropical seawater temperatures at such close latitude to the equator. The cold current coming up from the Antarctic and hitting the Andes range creates a unique climate and landscape. In order to fully understand this, a section is more appropriate than a map. The German scientist Alexander von Humboldt was the first European to realize that the section is key to understand the Central Andes region. So we like to redraw this section, including the sea current name after him. So we start with an horizontal line that represents the ocean, west to the left. Um, then comes an extremely steep topography with a 10,000 meter gradient in distance of only 200 kilometers. These geographical circumstances generate a unique landscape and a unique uh, climate. A mild temperature between 15 degrees and 28 Celsius, 
And no precipitation at all happens when a seawater convection and air thermic inversion combine uh, to create an almost permanent cloud over the desert strip uh, where Lima, our city, is located. And it's around here. So the projects we are uh, showing you are all in this edge between the, this, this uh, huge um, uh, underwater depression and the, 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 the Andes. This makes our tropic very different from the usual image we have of this latitude. So we have, uh, uh, at the same time, an extremely um, arid desert and yet a very humid one. Our coast is a misty desert with no shadows and no contrasts. Because of the lack of sunshine, like more or less like eight months uh, in a year. So it's hard to imagine that this could be uh, Lima as a tropical city. We have no rain, no cold days, no hot days, no strong winds. And we can say we live in a place with an absence of climate. We, we have earthquake, <laughs> but, but not climate. Uh, and we realized that, that only when we went to Europe to stay for more than 16 years. And we are, when we arrived to Europe, we realized that in, in Lima, for example, there are no TV weather forecasts. It's always the same. You know? And that's a, that's a huge thing, you know? Um, so it's, this, it's in the age of the Bay of Lima, in that square, that we had the opportunity to build the first project we are going to show you. That is the place of remembrance. The Commission for Truth and Reconciliation, in charge of uh, taking to public account the facts and responsibilities occurred during 20 years of political violence that caused more than 70,000 dead, had the aspiration to build a place for reconciliation uh, of Peruvian people. A national architectural competition was launched for the creation of a cultural center that would articulate the efforts to show to the future generations the memory of those years of intolerance in order to prevent repeating the errors of the past. And as Barry uh, said, um, Ken Frampton was part of the jury with uh, Rafael Moneo and, and Francesco Alco. So the site for the place of remembrance was a residual area left uh, by the destruction of one of these successions of cliff uh, and ravines that characterized the Bay of Lima when a roadway to the beaches wa was created in the 70s. We decided to embed the building with the same logic. Architecture will be related to memory not only by its content or programmatic content, but by revealing the memory of Lima's landscape. The building becomes then an artificial cliff that belongs to the territorial logic of Lima's Bay. In the same way, territory is more easily uh, understood by a section. From now on, we'll try to explain our projects almost only by the section. I think the section is, is uh, we think the section is more important than the plans because the section conveys um, not only space but also emotions. The plan is about organization more than emotions. So if we draw a cutoff um, longitudinal section of the cliffs, we locate a compact building near the natural cliff in order to economize both on the number of foundation piles and their depth. In, and in this way, the territorial logic meets the economic logic. We had very few um, money to do it. Um, it's the only um, museum of memory that was in, in Latin America that was uh, built despite the government, not by the government, but despite the government with um, money from uh, the German government, 
the Swedish government and the European Union. The, the Peruvian government didn't want this building at, at the beginning at least. So this simple strategy opened possibilities for responding also to environmental needs. Open the building to the cliff, allow that to control natural light, and closing it to the northwest at, at left, um, prevent us from the sunlight of the setting sun and the noise of the coastal highway. An upper in an inner space create a natural ventilation, limiting the use of air conditioning to the auditorium alone. And the sad the site had still a, a strong handicap, and that was that there was no connection uh, between the, this site and the city. Uh, only a narrow passage could be done to link it to the main urban avenue with public transportation. So we decided to transform this major uh, problem into a design opportunity. We could introduce time in the way we approach to the, to the building. The visitor must take time to distance himself from the city to leave daily preoccupations behind and to get ready for seeing uh, um, an exhibit which is not easy to, 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 to appreciate. The visitor is then literally uh, submerged in this gap creating, created between the cliff and, and, the, and the building. The act of descending into this crevice turns gravity in, into a very explicit force. At the bottom of this newly created ravine, uh, there is a marked physical consciousness, a kind of intensified uh, presence. And we are not more in a urban setting nor in a uh, natural landscape. We are um, in a place where we are giving ourselves the, the time for reflection. And time passes faster and faster these days, uh, as do the evolution of technology. On the opposite, we think that space endures and captures uh, time. Everything we, th we see here is in the order of the permanent. We don't have uh, layers. This is the, the, almost the finished building. And because uh, space is defined by structure and not by technology, um, this is the, the permanent side of the building. Once structure uh, is, defines what is permanent, it allows us also to configure uh, not only the interior space, as you see here, but also the transition space uh, between interior and exterior, which has the responsibility of capturing light and bringing it to the interior spaces. The notion of time is present also when we walk through the building. The research center, center and, the, and the different uh, exhibition spaces are accessible through a series of ramps, which of course is a magnificent device that we have, we architects have, in, in order to slow down um, our urban frenzy time and can climb smoothly, um, dissociating the, the, the path of the eye from the path of the, of the body. And this is one of the wonderful legacies of, our, of the modern movement that we like so much. And this is not a side work image is the, actually is the finished building before the connection, the collection came in. So only the railings and, and the vertical uh, white columns were are in the, in the order of the temporary that, because they contain uh, the technology, very low tech technology, but uh, sufficient to, to, to have this building built. Um, and the building process is very important for us because in our country, uh, the design process does not finish with construction plans. And that was one of the 
huge um, learnings we had from uh, coming back from France to Peru and seeing that you can still modify plants while building. And being aware that the quality of public construction in Peru is, is not good at all, the project strengths um, must not lay in the finishings, nor in a well-executed building. Uh, Le Corbusier uh, figured out that a long time before us, but uh, for Peru is very um, appropriate. The choice of pouring reinforced concrete manually allowed us to reproduce the matter found in the cliffs, alluvial strata, uh, merging with its mass and, and hue, making uh, use of artisanal formwork assembled by hand using old wooden planks, we introduce in determination that absorb the true imperfections. So we consider the traces of that imp those in in imperfections as part of the memory of the construction. The plans that are meant um, to set a future action lost their supremacy as the building itself started to draw um, a map that describes its construction process. The irregular walls, the cobble stone pavement, and the traces of handcrafting uh, are the evidence of human labor and become the maps of human intervention. At left, we can see the footprints of the watchdog you just saw in the previous slide that we insisted to keep them in the stamped cement floor of the ramps. At, at right, the workers put their hand in, in the entry to the public plaza as the uh, trace of the hands who literally built this place. So let's see now how the building becomes alive uh, and it's nowadays. It's a little video.
Bay called La Escondida, where we find uh, similar landscape conditions. And this cove, located some 120 kilometers south from Lima, is a place where we designed and built six beach houses in four consecutive years. It was an incredible design laboratory in which we learned from one house to another to relate to this landscape. In this mild coast, architecture loses one of its major reasons for existence, to, to provide shelter. Without the need for shelter, only the creation of intimacy is left to architecture. Intimacy allows to live in this vast and absolute territory. Ancient Peruvians understood this very well. The platforms and the enclosures are still valid strategies nowadays. By using them, we abandon the common strategy of doing a pretty object isolated in the landscape. We could focus on bringing the landscape logics into architecture, creating meaningful microcosmos in each house. So we draw a slope of the cove, then an emerging platform in order to define a new horizontal ground for life. After that, we define an enclosure that ensures domesticity and intimacy providing shade to the platform and framing the ocean view. Finally, a pool brings the ocean to the platform and serves as a natural railing. Underneath, we excavate the platform to create the rooms for intimacy, the bedrooms protected from the setting sun by the pool. From the ocean, the houses define platforms as extruded volumes from the cliff. And from the desert, they seem to be excavated on the sand. As we approach to the enclosure, suddenly we discovered a threshold between two exteriors, which take us into a larger exterior space pointing to the ocean. As the pools are a mandatory feature in a holiday house, we propose them as ludic spaces where we can relate with our neighbors. Underneath, they act as a protection for the bedrooms. Culture and technology can work together. Local craft conditions give us clues about forgotten or undervalued materials. The buildings industry is one of the main culprits of this forgetfulness and the obsolescence of certain materials through its most fearful instrument, the construction regulations. And a bench and a woman straw mat roof are enough to live here. To adapt industrial materials like glass to a surface which has been modeled by hand, the most simple gesture becomes the most appropriate, like this cut in concrete for fitting a sliding window in a non-so vertical wall.
they were the foundation of the previous houses. So even uh, it's a um, uh, British Islamic cement that is used only for foundation. And we discovered it these houses and because of their um, great quantity of ivory we became British and British. So, oops. this is another site when, where we were asked to design a bigger house in a larger site, but with using the same, more or less the same strategies. This is located 50 kilometers north from Lima. So the strategy of the platform and plinth was also used this time with a single roof providing shade to the social area. And the rest of the intimate spaces were uh, located, as usual, underneath the, the platforms. Their surfaces being used as garden or, or terraces. In this case, um, we used local stone and this uh, reddish uh, puzzolanic cement to build it. The enclosure fades away and our and you find your way into the house uh, by turning around containing walls. Transparency is only suggested. The spaces are revealed as we goes, uh, go through the site. We discover each time new, new uh, places in, in, this, in this site. The Baracas Desert, some 200 miles south from Lima, is one of the most arid uh, deserts in the world. People lived here 2,000 years ago and were the predecessors of the ones who traces the famous Nazca Lines. The Baracas Archaeological Site Museum was destroyed by a strong earthquake in 2007, and the European uh, Union financed its reconstru reconstruction and launched a competition uh, for uh, the following year. For us, it was not only about an archaeological museum, but also an attempt to introduce land landscape logics into architecture. We had at the same time a migrate budget and a sublime landscape with ochre and reddish stones. Seen from the archaeological burial site, the museum is perceived as a layer built over thousands of geographic and cultural layers. It modifies landscape and at the same time depends on it, as would a rock or a trace in the desert. Again, it's not about providing shelter, it's about providing the correct contained space for living. The first element we defined was, as usual, an enclosure for downscaling the vastness of the desert landscape. A horizontal roof is conceived as a fifth facade 
as an, as an element that can protect us from the sun and the strong winds of this region. Finally, a series of low-tech environmental devices find their place beneath the roof and help defining the exhibition spaces. Also help us control natural light and ventilation. The original museum was built in 1964 by German archeologist Frederick Engel. We decided to keep its memory by building in the exact same location, respecting the overall volume and geometry in order to avoid archaeological surveys that were mandatory if we built elsewhere in the site. As we couldn't reuse the stones and the original quarry was inside the protected area and therefore impossible to obtain new stones, we decided to use the same pozzolanic ceramic technique for finishing the pre-Columbian vases, rescaled to the size of the building. We used the same pozzolanic red cement of the beach houses, but this time it was polished as, as if it was a huge ancient vase. A porch announces the entrance to the enclosure, acting as a threshold between the vastness of the desert and the open air inner circulation. The different programs are related among them by an exterior circulation. The main volume contains the archeological exhibition, while the thin volume has the workshops, services, and space for community. The low-tech environmental devices show up in this circulation, and one of them constitute the entrance to the museographic spaces. These low-tech environmental devices help us control natural light and ventilation and define the exhibition spaces. They organize the museographical sequence in a continuous and fluid space. When the environmental devices reach the southern facade, they become windows framing the burial site. So now let's go to an urban setting for the next project. Yeah, we are uh, back to Lima, um, where we were asked this time to design a commercial high-end apartment building in a nice residential area. In order, I don't know, in order to have a, an idea, this is the place of remembrance, and this is the site of the, of the building, not far away. So again, the section can explain the project. Um, first, we draw the contained urban space that defines a public garden. We unfold this garden vertically to provide an intermediate space between the apartments and the urban space. This vertical garden um, is organized like a joint ownership common to all the dwellers, which ensures its permanence. The vertical garden is curved to embrace the public garden, creating a subtle tension between the two. So now we are going to explain in plan, <laughs> because um, the apartment circulation was very important for us. Is shown on, uh, in red um, <clears throat> because it could allow to um, change the configuration of the of the apartments without altering the exterior. We can have, for example, two three bedroom apartments or uh, different configuration two and, and four or four and two, depending on the need of the dwellers. And the exterior always remained the same, not showing the difference in the configuration. So uh, the east facade, that is the, the one who contains all the bedrooms, um, protect the, the, the bedrooms for, uh, from uh, rising sun and, and from the views of the, the building from which is taken this photo, while the living rooms open to the north and, and south facades, which are almost equivalent in, in an intertropical latitude. So th this is opening to the, the south and protecting us from the east. 
back again to the coastal desert, this time in the south of Peru, at the gate of the Atacama Desert. An architectural competition was organized to build the Moquegua Region Government Headquarters in the city of the same name. In the minds of the local Moquegua inhabitants, there are already certain elements which have a singular and defined shape and are landmark places in the city and in the landscape. The region headquarters is located in a new cultural and commercial neighborhood between the city and its river. The main square, a well-defined quadrangular void, and the city hall, a plain rectangular prisma, are two important landmarks made with local sandstone of the same color of the mountains. There are also land landscape landmarks, as this one, like uh, Cerro Baul Mountain. Cerro Baul is visible from the city, gives us a unique identity to this region, as it was once cohabitated by the two biggest empires which preceded the Incas. It is even the main feature in the coat of arms of the region. The building is located in a topography between the city and the mountains. We create again a plinth that contain this time services and archives to generate, to generate a new high ground. We again propose a compact structure to create public square in continuity with an atrium. This atrium frames views to the city and to the landscape. On top, different buildings are separated by narrow courtyards, allowing cross ventilation and direct control of sunlight. Five buildings cover a roofed atrium, which acts as the prolongation of the public space of the plaza. In this section, we see only three of them. The buildings, which have a north and south glazed facade, are illuminated through courtyards orientated and protected by the rising and setting sun by a circular blind perimeter. So in a similar way from the place of remembrance, we proposed a compact volume creating a public space that wasn't asked in the competition. Both the buildings and the courtyards are connected by a big central outdoor covered space. Their circumference encloses a rational orthogonal structure which allows us to be more efficient in the evacuation distance and therefore in the vertical course. This overall efficiency did not only pay for the plaza itself, but allowed to include seismic insulators that enable the building to be considered a shelter for the community as it will stand without damage in case of a major earthquake. To get into the building, you have to cross an exterior public atrium that merge into an exterior controlled atrium. Once you cross the atrium, you arrive to the central void, which is a covered outdoor space. The lateral courtyards are directly linked to this central space, framing the entry, the city, and the landscape. All the offices are lighted from these courtyards. The exterior, instead, protect them from high solar radiation and heat. We used cement precast panel as permanent shuttering for pouring concrete beams and bearing walls. The local cement plant was asked to produce two colors, but again, imperfection in the mixing process produced a large variety of tones, which was a gift for us, as the facade has now a very similar vari variety of the local stone. Then this video will show you how the building lives uh, one day.
que me llame urgente. Chile to the border with Ecuador, 2,000 kilometers north, to a much uh, warmer uh, conditions. Um, this is the last project that is located in, in, in Pura. So we are now four degrees south from the equator in a, in a booming uh, city where you can see there the, um, the, the campus of the University of Pura, which is this one. The local university uh, needed more space for welcoming a new student population coming from low-income rural milieu, thanks to the government scholarship. They decided to increase their capacity by building a new facility of generic classrooms um, and faculty offices. Their aspiration was to take this opportunity to improve teaching infrastructure and gave us the opportunity to go beyond a standard response to this need. And when the university was founded 50 years ago, it looked like the top image. Um, and you know, in the north of Peru, there's a, the Nino phenomenon when um, we are in a very arid desert and every 12 years comes uh, tropical rains for, for about six months. Um, and um, it came in 1973 uh, and the, the um, provost, following the advice of some professors, decided that the first uh, thing to do after they completed the, the first building was not to continue building another buildings, but to plant trees, these carob trees that uh, grow only in a, during a, a Nino phenomenon and then stay alive for 12 years searching for uh, the, the watershed that is 30 meters um, deep. So this vision um, took the university to look like this today um, and of course was an inspiration for us. Our, our first question was about how should be a place of learning here in this tropical dry forest in the middle of the desert. So reading Luican was of course a good hint if we wanted to go back to the roots of the question. He said schools began with a man under a tree who did not know he was a teacher, sharing his realization with a few others who did not know they, they were students. So that was very inspiring for us. And the tropical dry forest helped us translate this in a very easily into architecture. So again, uh, the section, and we start drawing the soft hills um, of the tropical dry forest and the trees, carob trees. And we started the project by extending the shade of the, the forest at the place of the building. 
So a single horizontal line is created to define a shaded space capable of creating good conditions for learning. Then the program grows, as, as in La Tourette, from the rooftop down to the ground. And the result is a series of buildings which are less important than the spaces in between them. And the natural dry forest can continue underneath the building, at least the, 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 their shade. And the spaces in between are the places for informal learning. The creation of these non-hierarchical places um, for students to, to study, eat, connect, and discuss together outside classrooms uh, contributed to creating a sense of community, blurring the social and economic boundaries between the newly arrived uh, students and the urban uh, students that were already there. These uh, thoughts uh, brought us to abandon the traditional type of educational building shifting from um, the typical academic building scheme to, into a learning landscape. And by doing that, we were not only uh, introducing the landscape of the dry forest into the building, at least the logics, but we were also creating a kind of new urban space within the forest. And as in a forest where the single tree is not more important than the whole, five different building types formed 11 uh, independent structures disposed within a 70 by 70 meters uh, square volume, nine meters high. The square shapes uh, is ideal in the forest uh, where there is no predominant orientation. So what we did is to align uh, the building with this sand path. At the ground level, this apparently compact uh, volume is in fact extremely permeable and shaded, invited students to cross it, connecting roads and people. In the second level, a clear square circulation has a strong visual connection with the ground level. So these, these sites are very di different between the, the following their orientation, the south uh, and north facades are protected by vertical louvers that are very efficient to protect uh, both facades in the vertical sun of the equator. This is the north one. And a system of prefab uh, concrete panels protect the faculty office from the setting sun. This is the west uh, side. And the building at the east side, the building that hosts the ramps and services, constitute the, the, um, the main side of, of the square where the entrances from the campus pedestrian pathway are, are located. So the entrance building is in, in fact a threshold where we pass from the strong glare of the equator to the shaded exterior spaces of the learning landscape. And this is not only a threshold, it also connects the ground floor to the second floor. And the, um, uh, the, light, the lattice shattering adapt our eyes to the shaded exteriors while we go up through the ramps or just enter the building. And inside, that is still an exterior space. The open air circulation are shaded, the narrow gaps um, that every individual building is leaving between them help the light come in and favors uh, natural ventilations. And the shaded and ventilated in between spaces provide places for casual meeting and informal learning among students. There are places which are um, more as a circulation, but other places which um, people can gather, uh, 
rest as the, as the worker there, or chat in between classes. And these spaces become um, more important as we get uh, into the complex until we arrive to this one, where that is uh, the core of the building, where the in intermediate spaces are crossed by a stretch of the tropical dry forest. And now we are going to uh, again see a day passing through this. Um, Cusco that we are going to show you because it's a new um, adventure we're uh, going into. It, it, it was an opportunity to explore um, how to work with uh, mountains, always defining uh, a platform and also uh, working with um, architecture that uh, can um, allow rain to come, uh, also working with uh, local materials as, as this uh, redstone, trying to figure out how can we still work with uh, ambiguity spaces in this uh, climate, blurring the, the uh, limits in between interior and exterior spaces, working with uh, sunlight from uh, vertical sunlight. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. 
for those of you who don't know me, at the beginning I started talking and didn't introduce myself. I'm Barry Bergdahl. I'm a professor in the art history department and curator at MoMA. Um, I just want to ask you one question and invite you to just add a little bit of a postscript because I was so intrigued by the studio description of the studio at Yale, which mm -hmm. takes off from the next to the last project from the uh, university that you've just designed, a whole, uh, essentially maybe not the entire university, but a kind of mini university campus in an uh, in a, in a internally turning um, village. Um, and your studio is called a learning from Pura, so learning from this place uh, and learning from the task to design an entire university. Campus is always fascinating because in a certain sense it's a microcosm of a city, so it already takes you to the urban level as well as to the landscape. So I'd, li I'd like to hear a bit about, and you define this as a, a climate change um, situation. Um, and although there really is no climate, I'm completely fascinated by next time I'm in a hotel in Peru, I'm going to enjoy the lack of weather reporting and <laughs> living between countries like France where, the, where if it snows a little bit, this is the subject of nonstop television coverage. Um, uh, and this country where every snowstorm gets to be a headline news in the New York Times for three days running. Um, but despite the fact that there is no weather, uh, Peru is a place, as you know, that's very much affected by changes in the climate. Uh, and you opened with the, um, the sort of topographical section of Alexander von Humboldt of the Andes. Very fascinating because I was waiting to say to you, but all of your projects are almost on the shelf at the edge of the ocean. You haven't been pushed up into that section up until now, but you also told us that the Humboldtian current, which is essentially a major weather controller in the Pacific, is changing, uh, just as the Gulf Stream is changing in the Atlantic. Uh, and as you draw those beautiful sections in which the bathymetry of the Pacific is in fact to be understood as not just simply something under the placid ocean, but uh, as something deeply related to what happens on the land and in the section that continues into the mountains. I wonder if you could just tell us something about what you're reflecting on the larger geological time, uh, the ge climatic changes that are, are coming uh, and that are already visible and how one uh, responds to that. So you're, you're now and during your second decade back in Peru, you, uh, you returned once peace was established and war began with a project that tried to deal with the, the uh, memory and the reconciliation uh, from that uh, traumatic past. But you now realize that your work is sitting at the, at the edge of the ongoing dramatic changes that we're facing in climate. And I wondered, so I wondered if you could tell us something about the Yale studio and tell us about how reflecting on climate change um, is affecting your thinking about, about place and architecture making. Yeah. Mainly the, the, the um, <clears throat> consequence of climate change in Peru is melting, the melting glaciers that provide, provides water to this coastal desert. So it's a desert with water availability, if, even if not so much. And now we have um, the problem of melting glaciers. So we will have like more water for 20 years and then no water at all. So they are already doing tunnels, bringing the water, at least in Lima, bringing the water from um, the Amazonian basin to the, the Pacific desert. But our studio was um, not very interesting in this consequence of climate change, but in the resilience that have, have been forged over the millennia in the north of Peru uh, because of the El Nino uh, uh, phenomenon. So we have this uh, cradle of uh, of um, agriculture that, that uh, 
was, was in the coast of, of northern Peru uh, that developed a certain resilience to uh, this phenomenon that occurs every 15 or 12 years. And the, what is happening is that uh, we are in a laboratory where there is a desertification process ongoing and at the same time, huge um, and very strong climate events. Um, so that's what will be happening in a lot of countries that are mostly of them mismanaged or so, that are mismanaged now. Um, climate change is not affecting as much the, the, the rich countries as the poor countries. So what fascinated us while doing this, this um, university facility in Pura was um, that all that is um, the houses and the dwellings of, of the people in the, in the um, not in, in Pura city, but in the countryside is made of very lightweight um, materials. materials with reeds and, and, and carob trees and, and mud so they are coping with this climate change not by um, trying to build very expensive houses that will stand to a, a flood, but uh, allowing the flood to come in, they lose their houses, but they can rebuild very easily afterwards. So that's a very different conception about um, permanence and and uh, and. and disasters. They are used to, to consider losing their house, not like a disaster, but like a, like a cyclical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So what, and these techniques are being lost because of the government policies that are trying to build houses in, in, a, in a very different way, in a traditional way. Um, that is not, uh, that has proven in the last El Niños to be uh, very contraproductive. Uh, so we, we are trying to um, make um, a place of uh, research in order to promote these this local um, building techniques that are disappearing. And what I was, we were saying in the podcast before coming here, um, we think that um, education or um, academia, um, at least in our countries, must not be all, only um, intellectual problem or um, uh, a theoretical uh, investigation or research but it has to prove reality. So what we are doing now at, at Yale is that we are thinking about um, different ways of building in this, in this context that we will present to the Pura's mayor. And, and, um, and we hope that these uh, centers that are research centers we, will also um, be a refuge uh, during El Nino uh, um, phenomenon for six months, they will be invested by people. And then when the flood go, goes out, um, they can rebuild their, their homes without any, uh, losing any uh, resource. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, it's an adventure. We don't know the results. We are uh, doing that because we don't know the answer. It's fascinating yeah. as a historian to hear you talk about this because it reminds me of the whole history of uh, interest in Peru in self-help housing and participatory housing of uh, the most mm -hmm. famous of which, of course, is Previ uh, in Lima, but not the only one, uh, which, you know, this has some parallels in a certain That's way a with, with that where one yeah. thinks about the inhabitant uh, as an actor yeah. Not simply as an occupant, but as a kind of actor in the in the future in the of the building. Yeah, yeah. yeah Previ was was uh, mm -hmm. uh, an, an excellent way 
uh, an excellent experiment of how to change the view of or, or the role of social housing, not provided only by, by the government, but also involving people yeah. of, in their construction. And in uh, Pura, uh, in our building, we didn't have to, to deal with this uh, um, flooding um, uh, situation because uh, the, in the site, we were in the upper part of, mm -hmm. of the university campus. So it's really um, uh, like a new, uh, for us also, it's a, a, a new uh, approach that we must mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, explore. Yeah, it's not, uh, we, we don't know really the answers, mm -hmm. but we are looking for projects that can manage these uh, also these flooding uh, problems. So as more, not only as buildings, but as infrastructures. I'm just going to ask one more question as a follow-up to that and then open it up to the people here to ask you other questions. But since you're teaching this in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, presumably it's not simply a closed circuit of learning from the residents, learning from the topography, learning from the climate, and also realizing that the climate as inherited will not be the climate maybe in, in 50 years or maybe even not next year. Um, but besides you learning from Pura and then Pura learning from Pura as uh, a kind of uh, um, a process of, of reinvesting resilience uh, into maybe government decisions that are not so resilient, um, how do you take this out of Peru? What, what can non-coastal Peruvians learn from Pura? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's more that what um, we can learn from we can learn them. from from <laughs> a fresh eye yes. from a, a different uh, yeah. reality or a different perspective or um, just, yeah. and and I think no, what what happens normally is that the rich countries um, go and and learn from poor countries and then go back to uh, to the rich countries and 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 uh, learn from what they have learned, and we are, want to do it the, the other way, a little bit, that rich countries can really um, n not only learn, but to give mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something to, to the other reality. So it's a, more a give and, and take than take and take it back to, to the rich countries. There are a lot of other topics I'd love to push you on in, in relationship to this wonderful body of work, and you chose only the, thank you for the self-restraint, the most recent Peruvian work and not the, mm -hmm. uh, not the French work, so I realize there's a lot that's edited out, but. By sounds, uh, the sounds of waves, which were more or less natural in, um, in the case of beach houses. Uh, but when you showed schools, there were always, you know, the sounds of people passing. Is just casual, or uh, have you ever thought about the relationship of sound to the other architectural means? I think no. I think it's more uh, uh, the photograph, uh, mm. photograph uh, vision. Of course, uh, this is so good. I yes, noticed there over and over again, Cristobal yeah. Palma, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and he, um, he likes to work with uh, time and, and light, so he, he wants to show always like a, a day, uh, a day in, in the building. And uh, uh, in, yeah, in, in, the sound is uh, yeah. The is sound there, is very important because, as as I I said at the beginning, architecture is not only about sight, no. Many no, senses, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, we are so used to only use one sense that is the, the sight, that we forgot that when we are in architecture we have all the other senses. Uh, uh, rumors, sounds, noises, uh, 
temperature, uh, textures, mm -hmm. and those are very important. And that's why we we like to show these videos because they are showing a little bit closer to the sense of what we uh, experience, what we can experience. And even though it's it's very difficult, and that was one of the our main um, concerns when the uh, Graftons invited us to the last Venice Biennale to show this building mm -hmm. because we were convinced that um, if we showed a model or a photograph or plants, we would not be able to, sh to, to, to transmit this feeling of space, temperature, um, light, and movement. So we decided to put what is not in the building, uh, but it was used to, to build it. That was the, um, the um, formworks. formworks of the lattice panels. And, and to show a video that was much longer than the one we showed, uh, showing a whole day in, in one hour. So we, we tried to bring the, 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 the purest light, the northern Peruvian light, to Venice, projected in a, in a Venetian wall, while uh, filtering Venetian light through the, the, um, the formwork of the lattice mm. work. So it was a kind of experiment of, on how to show a building without any models, plants, or, or images. Yeah, and, and also working with what, what was available in, in the site they gave us, that was natural light, because for the first time they, they opened the, the, the windows mm -hmm. in, in the Arsenale, yes. and it was right. really yeah, wonderful. Yeah, but it's, it's true that, the, that sound uh, helped us to, to have the atmosphere uh, to be more... Uh, uh, cerca, no? uh, yeah. near this, mm -hmm. this feeling of atmosphere. It occurs to me one of the really beautiful things in the place of memory, and I love the fact that you showed us the, the site before, mm. and almost anybody who's an architect in the room had to think, how in the world can you possibly, it's not even a site, it's a kind of non-site, mm -hmm. um, but that you created the capacity to experience that section and to move through that landscape where, in fact, in Lima, the very few places that are intermediary between being up on the plateau, yeah. mm -hmm. which has an esplanade, especially in that section of Miraflores, an esplanade along it, you can look out, kind of like the equivalent of maybe uh, Santa Monica in Los Angeles or you know, Malibu, and then you have this highway and mm -hmm. beach there, but you don't, mm -hmm. this, you don't occupy. So it's not only that your building itself is derived from this very rich reflection on section, but the occupiable kind of landscape section of that hill, which also has an auditory element of, of hearing the ocean coming up through and feeling the winds coming up through uh, that cut, which otherwise doesn't really exist as part of the uh, coastal experience at Lima. That was to give you all time for more questions. Are there any other questions out there in the audience? Uh, thank you for your presentation and for the work. It's really quite beautiful. Um, I wonder if you can speak about the differing scales and differing um, contexts in which the buildings have been produced and how you've navigated those where it seems like you have a very close um, relationship with the craft of the building and then in the multifamily project or the municipal project or even the university where things get much larger, um, whether there's a difference in the process in terms of the realization of the building and how you feel or whether you feel there is has been a shift um, relative to the intimacy uh, with the materiality or how, what the translations have been in some of the larger projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, we, we we, we feel we do always the same project. You know? and at the same time, there are different conditions for this project. 
Um, but what we, we are f focusing, regardless of the scale of the, of the building, is this creation of intimacy or belonging, um, or trying to capture um, exterior space in an interior quality space. You know, it's a, I don't know uh, how to explain it in, in, in intelligent words in English, but, but we are trying to um, create um, exterior spaces that are interior, that, are, that have these um, qualities of um, uh, uh, interiorness, um, which includes intimacy, etc. So I, I didn't. Yeah, yeah from a design that. standpoint, I think that that's very clear across mm -hmm. the projects. I, I, my curiosity is more whether in some of the larger projects, whether the realization is the way that you describe it with such intimacy in terms of the embrace of imperfection, et cetera, and the closeness with the crafts people. Mm -hmm. um, is that the same regardless of the scale or mm -hmm. complexity mm -hmm. of the project? In, in our first project uh, in Peru, when we were working still in, in France, and we, we had this first opportunity to design a house. Um, and uh, we knew we couldn't be present in the site, uh, in the construction process. We decided to, to first of all, um, uh, try to, to be as, like, uh, uh, keep the essential uh, part of the, um, the architectural decision, so uh, work with the space, with really less details, little details, and uh, or little, um, um, not, not that uh, complexity in the details, because um, um, it, it wasn't, it, it was the time where we communicated by faxes, and really it wasn't possible to, to, to be in, in the site. I think that that logic of uh, keep simple and, and uh, not too much uh, complexity in the details and let the structure define the space um, stay with us in, in the other projects. So even working with uh, large scale projects, we try to, to keep like that and in the process, in the build process, we try to to talk to the people that are building, to try to communicate uh, um, that, uh, because the, the um, um, try to um, uh, work with them in, in searching quality, in not not as as uh, perfection, but as uh, trying to do the best they can and and. Uh, and I think the quality, uh, the builders, they, they, are, they, they have a really good culture in building. So normally they are I think willing I, to do that. I know? think it's, it's interesting to say that uh, architects are not responsible of the of site works. So mm -hmm. we are not, um, we have no uh, responsibility and no power in the site works during the construction. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a, a big disadvantage, but also it's a kind of an advantage mm -hmm. because uh, as we don't have power, we can go wh wh whenever we want and talk not to the, to the um, bosses, but talk to the people, to, to, to the would, workers. That, that and the workers are, <laughs> are, are still, <laughs> You know, the, the craftsmanship in Peru is still is disappearing, but it's still concerned about, about doing well, mm -hmm. which doesn't exist, for example, in France anymore. Um, so, so you can change things in the process also. And, so so uh, we're right like, like Just a, convincing them yeah, that it, it that, would be like better. Like a real, uh, no, go, going uh, without the, the bosses knowing and talking to people and telling them to to do that or to take care of 
some things. Mm -hmm. and, th and that was, for example, a, a big learning in the, in the place of remembrance, yeah. where, where we were commissioned to, officially commissioned to um, oversee the, the construction from the architectural point of view, but we didn't have any, any power. So, so, and the builder was, we were in a very um, complicated uh, time when there, there were, it was an election time and if the daughter of Fujimori was elected, the, 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 the building was not uh, built at all and the other candidate, we didn't know if he was going to be, uh, it, it's, it's opening to, to this building. So um, there was only one contractor who presented to the tender, and, and the contractor never built a, a building. Was it his was first, his it, first building. It was his its first building, and they, they, it was a contractor that built uh, sewage, to, uh, urban sewage. So so it was very interesting to tell the workers that this was a very important building for the country for themselves and, and for every Peruvian. So we started a dynamic that um, they were telling, um, uh, for example, don't tell to my boss, but I will do it, or I will try <laughs> to do it better, uh, don't worry. So, uh, and these kind of things are still existing in every, at every scale of, of buildings. Uh, at every moment. So we like very much to continue to, to the design process during the, the building process, which is impossible here, is impossible in Europe, is impossible in Japan. So that's, I think that we are going to lose at some stage, mm -hmm. but we have to explore while it, it is possible. No? So we're exploring that way. Maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I was just um, curious if you've been asked to do a project in the context of more density, and because um, there's a strong engagement with your project with landscape, but maybe the notion, like what if the notion of landscape is more like an urban landscape, and how would your strategy change, or would it still be about this generation of intimacy and the projects. Mm -hmm. I think it's the, the same strategy. We, we consider the, the city as, as a landscape also. And there, there are considerations that are not o only of, of the, the order of landscape, but other con considerations, um, environmental considerations, etc. But in, in Lima, that is a um, sprawl city, uh, a suburb city with no uh, strong uh, relationships to, to historical buildings. At least we, we, we've never been confronted to, to build besides a, an historical building. I think you, you, you have quite um, freedom of acting in the city. And, and we have also a big advantage, I think, that is that for um, our um, most important legacy comes from the pre-Columbian uh, remains that are very far away. We, we don't understand them anymore, only as, as objects uh, or as uh, design strategies, but we, we don't know the, the uses. The, the so we have this uh, as a... As a, as a heritage for, for us, for architecture. And then we, we didn't really have had um, um, uh, big names in modern architecture. We, we didn't have had Barragan or, or uh, Clorindo Testa or I don't know, or, or Villanueva. Um, so, so we are, we, we, we don't have to kill our fathers. No? <laughs> So, so we're, we're kind of really free to, to, to do architecture as, as uh, in other terms, not confronting to, to, to the weight of history. 
No, no. Mm -hmm. and, and in, in our urban uh, projects, we are always trying to convince the client, but because they are almost uh, private clients, to offer something to the city, you know, to uh, make some generosity, maybe a little sp uh, public space uh, in the ground level, or maybe um, taking out the, the walls between the, the site and the street, or um, like trying to uh, build a better, uh, also a better city. Yeah. It's well, it, little by little. It, you, well, it's very dramatic in the in the place mm -hmm. of memory because you yes. didn't you didn't so much insist upon it, but it was clear in all of those views the fact that the roof becomes the first encounter with the building, and the roof is a public yes. plaza yes. and an auditorium mm -hmm. and uh, a kind of open-ended proposition of what mm -hmm. you might do there, mm -hmm. in a place that didn't exist before, yeah. as yeah. well as being mm -hmm. a connector, be, you know, through the section as we discussed. So I think that is. That project is already a monument to wanting to, around the concept yes. of memory and reconciliation, mm -hmm. to give a place to a city yeah, to which that, has, in yeah. fact, very few, few. Yes. public, <laughs> public, uh, public places. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I think so, it's time to, to thank you and hope you'll that. come back again in a few years with another rich portfolio <laughs> of this. Yeah, and um, some of us will probably make the pilgrimage either north or south to find out what the ongoing lessons of Pura are, but thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>